The English longbow, also called the Welsh longbow, is a powerful type of medieval longbow about six feet long used by the English and Welsh for hunting and as a weapon in medieval warfare. English use of longbows was effective against the French during the Hundred Years' War, particularly at the start of the war in the battles of Sluz, Cre Acute, Cy, and Poitiers, and perhaps most famously at the Battle of Agincourt. They were less successful after this, with longbowmen having their lines broken at the Battle of Vernoy, and being completely rooted at the Battle of Pate when they were charged before they had set up their defensive position. The earliest longbow known from England, found at Ashcot Heath, Somerset, is dated to 2665 BC, but no longbows survive from the period when the longbow was dominant, probably because bows became weaker, broken were replaced, rather than being handed down through generations. More than 130 bows survive from the Renaissance period, however, more than 3,500 arrows and 137 whole longbows were recovered from the Mary Rose, a ship of Henry VIII's navy that sank at Portsmouth in 1545. Description Length A longbow must be long enough to allow its user to draw the string to a point on the face or body, and the length therefore varies with the user. In continental Europe it was generally seen as any bow longer than 1.2 meters. The Society of Antiquaries says it is of 5 or 6 feet in length. Richard Bartellet, of the Royal Artillery Institution, said that the bow was of U, 6 feet long, with a 3-foot arrow. Gaston Phoebus, in 1388, wrote that a long bow should be, of you or boxwood, 70 inches, 1.8 meters, between the points of attachment for the cord. Historian Jim Bradbury said they were an average of about 5 feet and 8 inches. All but the last estimate were made before the excavation of the Mary Rose where bows were found ranging in length from 1.87 to 2.11 meters with an average length of 1.98 meters. Draw weights estimates for the draw of these bows varies considerably. Before the recovery of the Mary Rose, Count M. Mild May Stainer, recorder of the British Longbow Society, estimated the bows of the medieval period drew 90 to 110 pounds force maximum, and Mr. W. F. Patterson, chairman of the Society of Archer Antiquaries, believed the weapon had a supreme draw weight of only 80 to 90 lbf. Other sources suggest significantly higher draw weights. The original draw forces of examples from the Mary Rose are estimated by Robert Hardy at 150 to 160 lbf at a 30-inch draw length. The full range of draw weights was between 100 to 185 lbf. The 30-inch draw length was used because that is the length allowed by the arrows commonly found on the Mary Rose. A modern longbow's draw is typically 60 lbf or less, and by modern convention measured at 28 inches. Historically, hunting bows usually had draw weights of 50 to 60 lbf, which is enough for all but the very largest game in which most reasonably fit adults can manage with practice. Today, there are few modern longbowmen capable of using 180 to 185 lbf bows accurately. A record of how boys and men trained to use the bows with high draw weights survives from the reign of Henry VII. My yeoman father taught me how to draw, how to lay my body in my bow, not to draw with strength of arms as divers other nations do. I had my bows bought me according to my age and strength. As I increased in him, so my bows were made bigger and bigger. For men shall never shoot well unless they be brought up to it, Hugh Latimer. What Latimer meant when he describes laying his body into the bow was described thus. The Englishman did not keep his left hand steady, and draw his bow with his right, but keeping his right at rest upon the nerve, he pressed the whole weight of his body into the horns of his bow. Hence probably arose the phrase bending the bow, and the French of drawing, 1. W. Gilpin 
construction and materials the bow stave the preferred material to make the long bow was yew, although ash, elm and other woods were also used. Geraldus Cambrensis, Gerald of Wales, speaking of the bows used by the Welsh men of Gwent, says, they are made neither of horn, ash nor yew, but of elm, ugly unfinished looking weapons, but astonishingly stiff, large and strong, and equally capable of use for long or short shooting. The traditional construction of a longbow consists of drying the yew wood for one to two years, then slowly working the wood into shape, with the entire process taking up to four years. The bow stave is shaped into a D section. The outer back of sapwood, approximately flat, follows the natural growth rings. Modern bowyers often thin the sapwood, while in the Mary Rose bows the back of the bow was the natural surface of the wood, only the bark being removed. The inner side of the bow stave consists of rounded heartwood. The heartwood resists compression and the outer sapwood performs better in tension. This combination in a single piece of wood forms a natural laminate, somewhat similar in effect to the construction of a composite bow. Long bows will last a long time if protected with a water-resistant coating, traditionally of wax, resin and fine taglio. The trade of yew wood to England for long bows was such that it depleted the stocks of yew over a huge area. The first documented import of yew bow staves to England was in 1294. In 1350 there was a serious shortage, and Henry IV of England ordered his royal bow yew to enter private land and cut yew and other woods. In 1470 compulsory practice was renewed, and hazel, ash, and laburnum were specifically allowed for practice bows. Supplies still proved insufficient, until by the Statute of Westminster in 1472. Every ship coming to an English port had to bring four bow staves for every tonne. Richard III of England increased this to ten for every tonne. This stimulated a vast network of extraction and supply, which formed part of royal monopolies in southern Germany and Austria. In 1483, the price of bow staves rose from 2 to 8 pounds per hundred, and in 1510 the Venetians obtained 16 pounds per hundred. In 1507 the Holy Roman Emperor asked the Duke of Bavaria to stop cutting yew, but the trade was profitable, and in 1532 the royal monopoly was granted for the usual quantity, if there are that many. In 1562, the Bavarian government sent a long plea to the Holy Roman Emperor asking him to stop the cutting of yew, and outlining the damage done to the forests by its selective extraction, which broke the canopy and allowed wind to destroy neighbouring trees. In 1568, despite a request from Saxony, no royal monopoly was granted because there was no yew to cut and the next year Bavaria and Austria similarly failed to produce enough yew to justify a royal monopoly. Forestry records in this area in the 17th century do not mention yew, and it seems that no mature trees were to be had. The English tried to obtain supplies from the Baltic, but at this period bows were being replaced by guns in any case. The string bowstrings were, and still are, made of hemp, flax or silk, and attached to the wood via horn, nox, that fit onto the end of the bow. Modern synthetic materials are now commonly used for strings. The arrow A wide variety of arrows were shot from the English longbow. Variations in length, fletchings and heads are all recorded. Perhaps the greatest diversity lies in hunting arrows, with varieties like broad arrow, wolf arrow, dog arrow, Welsh arrow and Scottish arrow being recorded. War arrows were ordered in the thousands for medieval armies and navies, supplied in sheaves normally of 24 arrows. For example, between 1341 and 1359 the English crown is known to have obtained 51,350 sheaves. Only one significant group of arrows, from the Mary Rose, has survived. Over 3,500 arrows were found, mainly made of poplar but also of ash, beech and hazel. Analysis of the intact specimens shows their length to vary from 61 to 83 centimeters, with an average length of 76 centimeters. Because of the preservation conditions of the Mary Rose, no arrowheads survived. 
However, many heads have survived in other places, which has allowed typologies of arrowheads to be produced. The most modern being the Jessup typology. The most common arrowheads in military use were the short bodkin and a small barbed arrow. Use and performance. Training longbows were very difficult to master because the force required to deliver an arrow through the improving armor of medieval Europe was very high by modern standards. Although the draw weight of a typical English longbow is disputed, it was at least 360 newtons and possibly more than 600 n, with some estimates as high as 900 n. Considerable practice was required to produce the swift and effective combat shooting required. It was the difficulty in using the longbow that led various monarchs of England to issue instructions encouraging their ownership and practice including the Assize of Arms of 1252 and King Edward III's Declaration of 1363, whereas the people of our realm, rich and poor alike, were accustomed formally in their games to practice archery, whence by God's help. It is well known that high honor and profit came to our realm, and no small advantage to ourselves in our warlike enterprises that every man in the same country, if he be able-bodied, shall, upon holidays, make use, in his games, of bows and arrows, and so learn and practice archery, if the people practiced archery. It would be that much easier for the king to recruit the proficient longbowman he needed for his wars along with the improving ability of gunfire to penetrate plate armor. It was the long training needed by longbowmen that eventually led to their being replaced by musketmen. Range The range of the medieval weapon is not accurately known, with much depending on both the power of the bow and the type of arrow. It has been suggested that a flight arrow of a professional archer of Edward III's time would reach 400 yards but the longest mark shot it on the London practice ground of Finsbury Fields in the 16th century was 345 yards. In 1542, Henry VIII set a minimum practice range for adults using flight arrows of 220 yards. Ranges below this had to be shot with heavy arrows. Modern experiments broadly concur with these historical ranges. A 667 N Mary Rose replica longbow was able to shoot a 53.6 grams arrow 328 meters and a 95.9 grams a distance of 249.9 meters. In 2012, Joe Gibbs shot a 2.25 ounces livery arrow 292 yards with a 170 lbfu bow. Armor penetration modern testing in an early modern test by Saxton Pope, a direct hit from a steel bodkin point penetrated Damascus male armor. A 2006 test was made by Matteo Spain using a 75 lbf draw bow, shooting at 10 yards, according to Bain's calculations. This would be approximately equivalent to a 110 lbf bow at 250 yards. Measured against a replica of the thinnest contemporary jack coat armor, a 905-grain needle bodkin and a 935-grain curved broadhead penetrated over 3.5 inches. Against high-quality riveted my, the needle bodkin and curved broadhead penetrated 2.8. Against a coat of plates, the needle bodkin achieved 0.3 penetration. The curved broadhead did not penetrate but caused 0.3 of deformation of the metal. Results against plate armor of minimum thickness were similar to the coat of plates, in that the needle bodkin penetrated to a shallow depth. The other arrows not at all. In Bain's view, the plate armor would have kept out all the arrows if thicker or worn with more padding. Other modern tests described by Bain include those by Williams, Robert Hardy's tests, and a primitive archer test which demonstrated that a long bow could penetrate a plate armor breastplate. However, the primitive archer test used a 160 lbf long bow at very short range, generating 160 joules so probably not representative of battles of the time. In 2011, Mike Lodes conducted an experiment in which short bodkin arrows were shot at a range of 10 yards by bows of 140 pounds force. 
The target was covered in a riveted mail over a fabric armor of deer skin over 24 linen layers. While most arrows went through the mail layer, none fully penetrated the textile armor. The experimenters, however, concluded that a long bodkin arrow would have penetrated through this armor combination. Even so, Lodes cautions that this experiment did not reflect normal combat ranges and used powerful bows so may not be typical of battlefield performance. Other research has also concluded that later medieval armor, such as that of the Italian city-state mercenary companies, was effective at stopping contemporary arrows. Contemporary accounts Gerald of Wales commented on the power of the Welsh longbow in the 12th century. I and the war against the Welsh, one of the men of arms was struck by an arrow shot at him by a Welshman. It went right through his thigh, high up, where it was protected inside and outside the leg by his iron cuirasses, and then through the skirt of his leather tunic. Next it penetrated that part of the saddle which is called the alva or seat, and finally it lodged in his horse driving so deep that it killed the animal. Against massed men in armor, massed longbows were murderously effective on many battlefields. Strickland and Hardy suggest that, even at a range of 240 yards heavy war arrows shot from bows of poundages in the mid to upper range possessed by the Mary Rose bows would have been capable of killing or severely wounding men equipped with armor of wrought iron. Higher quality armor of steel would have given considerably greater protection, which accords well with the experience of Oxford's men against the elite French vanguard at Poitiers in 1356, and Desersen's statement that the French knights of the first ranks at Agincourt, which included some of the most important nobles, remained comparatively unhurt by the English arrows. Archery was described by contemporaries as ineffective against Play Tamar in the Battle of Neville's Cross, the Siege of Bergerac, and the Battle of Poitiers. Such armor became available to European knights of fairly modest means by the late 14th century, though never to all soldiers in any army. Longbowmen were however effective at Poitiers, and this success stimulated changes in armor manufacture partly intended to make armored men less vulnerable to archery. Nevertheless, at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415 and for some decades thereafter, English longbowmen continued to be an effective battlefield force. Summary modern tests and contemporary accounts agree therefore that well-made play Tama could protect against longbows. However this did not necessarily make the longbow ineffective. Thousands of longbowmen were deployed in the English victory at Agincourt against play armored French knights in 1415. Clifford Rogers has argued that while longbows might not have been able to penetrate steel breastplates at Agincourt they could still penetrate the thinner armor on the limbs. Most of the French knights advanced on foot bit, exhausted by walking across wet muddy terrain in heavy armor enduring a terrifying hail of arrow shot. They were overwhelmed in the melee. Less heavily armored soldiers were more vulnerable than knights. For example, enemy crossbowmen were forced to retreat at Cressy when deployed without their protecting pavises. Horses were generally less well protected than the knights themselves. Shooting the French knights' horses from the side is described by contemporary accounts of the Battle of Poitiers. And at Agincourt John Keegan has argued that the main effect of the longbow would have been in injuring the horses of the mounted French knights. Shooting rate A typical military longbow archer would be provided with between 60 and 72 arrows at the time of battle. Most archers would not shoot arrows at maximum rate, as it would exhaust even the most experienced man. With the heaviest bows, a modern war bow archer does not like to try for more than six a minute. Not only do the arms and shoulder muscles tire from the exertion, but the fingers holding the bowstring become strained. Therefore, actual rates of shooting in combat would vary considerably. Ranged volleys at the beginning of the battle would differ markedly from the closer, aimed shots as the battle progressed and the enemy neared. On the battlefield English archers stored their arrows stabbed upright into the ground at their feet, reducing the time it took to notch, draw and shoot. 
Arrows were not unlimited, so archers and their commanders took every effort to ration their use to the situation at hand. Nonetheless, resupply during battle was available. Young boys were often employed to run additional arrows to longbow archers while in their positions on the battlefield. The longbow was the machine gun of the Middle Ages. Accurate, deadly, possessed of a long range and rapid rate of fire, the flight of its missiles was likened to a storm. This rate was much higher than that of its Western European projectile rival on the battlefield, the crossbow. It was also much higher than the standard early firearms. Although the lower training requirements and greater penetration of firearms eventually led to the longbow falling into disuse. Treating arrow wounds the only way to remove an arrow cleanly was to tie a piece of cloth soaked in water to the end of it and push it through the victim's wound and out the other side, this was extremely painful. There were specialized tools used in the medieval period to extract arrows from places where bone prevented the arrow being pushed through. Prince Hal, later Henry V, was wounded in the face by an arrow at the Battle of Shrewsbury. The royal physician John Bradmore had such a tool made, which consisted of a pair of smooth tongs. Once carefully inserted into the socket of the arrowhead, the tongs screwed apart till they gripped its walls and allowed the head to be extracted from the wound. Prior to the extraction, the hole made by the arrow shaft had been widened by inserting larger and larger dowels of elder pith wrapped in linen down the entry wound. The dowels were soaked in honey, now known to have antiseptic properties. The wound was then dressed with a poultice of barley and honey mixed in turpentine. After 20 days the wound was free of infection.